Hi there, today I'm going to show you and describe the way I stretch and prepare my canvas. And as I've hinted in the title, I'll also talk about some practices that I should either discard, adjust or introduce into my process. In any case, the canvas will be stretched, primed and ready for painting at the end of the video. So, let's go. The process normally starts with the wooden support that is loosely called a stretcher but there are actually two types of these kinds of supports one is called a strainer and the other is called a stretcher the difference is strainers have fixed corners because the corners are nailed onto each other this means this particular support or this strainer will always be within these dimensions but stretchers come with keys which are small wooden triangles that can be pressed into the slots and enable the limits of the measurements to expand just a little now why is it important to use stretchers as opposed to what i'm using in the painting which is a strainer it's because canvas being hygroscopic fabric or a fabric that absorbs moisture and is able to expand and contract with temperature changes will eventually end up sagging just a little and the solution to fix this sagging if using a stretcher is to press or hammer the keys into the joint to accommodate the extra expansion that the canvas shall have gone through by then with a strainer the solution is to actually remove the canvas and stretch it again or create a slightly bigger support for it one more thing to look out for when making any kind of support for canvas is that the stretcher should have a bevel or a slope on its front side on the side that's going to hold the canvas and this is because either if a canvas is under insufficient tension and i'll show you how to create enough tension in a canvas or if individual planks of wood are not beveled then the canvas is likely to come in contact with the wood at least in the inside part and over time this will result in the formation of a mark that will be following the contours of the stretcher in front so here's an example from one of my paintings that i didn't stretch properly this is from 2016 that shows you what might happen if you use the wrong kind of stretcher next up i'm going to get my canvas ready for stretching and by the way the process whether using a strainer or a stretcher is called stretching i want to use the word stretching a lot but the wooden support that i'm using is called a strainer so to stretch the canvas i'm going to lay it down on the floor i lay the strainer on the canvas and leave just enough space that will allow me to cover the sides and a bit of the back i'll use a piece of chalk to draw in where i want the borders to be and it's normally better to cut more canvas than i need than to cut too little then it becomes difficult to add canvas onto an inner adequate amount my foot will then hold it into place and the rest of the strainer will act as a ruler that will give me a straight line along both edges when this is done i'll use a pair of scissors to cut the canvas that i need then i'm going to use my staple gun to staple the canvas onto the strainer at this point i'm going to talk a little about staples which happen to be a point of contention amongst artists conservators and sometimes even galleries as well the question being which is the best way to stretch canvases is it using staples or using tacks because you don't know what tacks are these are just the small very sharp nails that are alternatively used to attach canvases to frames while i was making the video i reached out to to someone I consider professional who is Julian Baumgartner from Baumgartner Restoration and in the midst of a conversation about staples and tacks he said in a quote Hi Clevers, funny that you mentioned this. I feel like I've gone over why staples are inferior so many times that everyone is sick of hearing it. Instead of one hole in the canvas like with tacks, staples create two holes and the bridge connecting the two posts will either indent or weaken the canvas or outright cut it. Further, because staples are super easy to use, People often overdo it and put way too many staples in, which weakens the canvas. Staples are also thin and not at all robust. The metal they're made with is usually port metal and deteriorates easily. Staples are not a fidelity product and if an artist wants their work to last, choosing the best materials they can afford is good practice. Now, there are ways to counter these potential pitfalls and even though I use some of them in the process of stretching this canvas i'm going to talk about some that i don't use but that could also do the job just well now there's the problem of the bridge that connects the two poles in the staple weakening the canvas one way to avoid this potential problem is to insert your staples flush inserting them flush means not pressing them all the way down into the canvas so that the only part of each staple that's going to touch the canvas is the part that digs inside it and not the bridge because yes that bridge could risk weakening the canvas if you place all your staples in a single horizontal row, then you potentially create a weak point along that line. So one way to fix that is to place the staples diagonally across the support and not parallel to its length or its width. 
normally when stretching I start from the midpoint of each side and stretch it to the max and so this creates a sort of diamond in the center of the painting and then I stretch the rest of the painting outwards from the middle not from the sides and the corners will be the last part of the canvas that I will attach to the strainer. I don't get rid of the canvas in the corners. The artists who prefer to cut it out but my thinking is since this is the part of the painting that's going to be under the most tension it's kind of necessary that there's more material supporting it. But one thing I try to avoid is to overdo it because I also have to remove staples a lot when I have to roll a painting for shipping. And if I use too many staples, the process of removing it is normally a headache. Now here you can see the advantage of having that bevel I was talking about in the beginning of the video. The space between the strainer and the canvas is important so that when I'll be painting, I'll be painting on a completely flat surface. I'll then lightly slap the canvas just to get rid of any pieces of strain or fabric from the canvas itself and other things it may have picked up on the floor and now the canvas is ready for priming. The reason why canvas is primed before painting is to block all those little pores that are to be expected in any piece of woven fabric which is what canvas is. The paint that I use for this is silk vinyl and it's a water-based paint that has a slightly acrylic feel to it and I actually also use it as white acrylic. I don't buy white acrylic paint. They combine really well and even the next step you'll see an example of that. I do not like painting on white. It's just way too bright for my taste and that brightness kind of influences the colors that I end up using in my final painting process. So to avoid having to do that, I normally apply a mixture of all the discarded acrylic paints that I normally use in my underpainting. I try to apply this layer of acrylic just before the primer dries completely so they kind of mix together so that my paintings don't have a distinct base layer and a background layer. I've seen acrylic paint peeling off of canvases before. It doesn't happen often. It's very difficult to do it. But just to avert that possibility, I tend to mix my background layer with the primer. And that's why as I apply it, you can see the paint that's on the canvas looks a little lighter than the one in the tin. Next up, I don't just leave it to dry as it is because as you can see, if I do that, it's going to have some quite unsavory brush marks all over the canvas. So to even that out or to simulate some sort of pattern which won't be that far away from how the canvas itself actually looks, I run the brush in kind of parallel lines across the paint that hasn't dried yet so that when it dries, I have an even surface, not only texturally speaking, but also in the way it looks. I didn't remember to do this in this particular process, but it would be good practice as well, at least to make the painting look a little neat, to wipe off all those excessive paints that are kind of dripping on the sides just before they dry. I tend to fix this anyway by painting a layer of thick white silk vinyl along the sides of all my paintings but to make an easier job of it it would be better to just wipe this stuff off before it dries. And with that I now have myself a stretched primed and prepared canvas just waiting for the next painting. And no I will not confuse it with my wall. Thanks for watching. Some practices, algunos, algunos vías, algunas vías. Listo para pintar. Vamos. Hi, what's going on? Eh? <laughs> oh. Okay, no more Spanish. No more terrible Spanish. <clears throat> Hi, what's going on? Today I'm going to talk about and describe the process I used to create.